Just listen to these words. The Apostle Paul in the Church of Philippi, this is actually one of the earliest hymns sung in the life of the church. And he talks about the humbling of Jesus, leaving glory, coming among us. But then in verse 9 of Philippians chapter 2, he writes, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Somebody say amen, praise God, say something. Amen. amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Yeah. Amen. And thank you, worship team, for leading us into the presence of Jesus. Thank you so much. Yeah. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Colossians. We're spending this year walking through this little book written to a, a small town off the beaten path. And yet, God's people were there, so God spoke to them. And as I was preparing, and I shared on Sunday, I really felt like God had given me a message that, that um, really for those that say, I want to be a committed Christian, as we start, as we start this journey of this, this uh, we're going to have a seven-week series starting this Sunday called Metrics, Measurements That Matter. How do I know I'm growing in my faith? How do I know I'm maturing as a Christian? And, and this passage really looks at what is the call of a committed Christian? What does it look like to follow Jesus? And as I was preparing, and as I, this morning as I preach, I always preach through this, my sermon before I ever preach it for anybody else, I just preach it for Jesus. And, uh, and I just uh, kind of let my heart kind of engage with what God has prepared me to speak. And, and I was preaching this morning just by myself uh, with Jesus, and I, I was thinking about uh, years ago I got a chance to visit uh, a church in South Central Los Angeles. I, th I think it was called Zion Community Baptist Church, and a guy named E.B. Hill was the pastor, and E.B. Hill, I got to hear him preach, and loved his ministry, and he's with Jesus now, but, but um, he, at one point he said something like this, as, as we're getting ready to preach, he, sa he said this, he said, I feel a preach coming on, <laughs> he said, I feel it, I feel a preach coming on, and, and that's how I feel today, I feel like God has given a word, and if you'll open your heart and be receptive, if you'll open your Bible, if you have it, we'll have the passage up on the screen, but if you'll open the word, if you open your heart, I believe God wants to speak to us. And so I want to think together about the call of a committed Christian. What does it look like? And if God has put you in any role of leadership, please pay attention. Because there's words here for you to think about. What does this look like as I lead my family and my children and my grandchildren? That's leadership. And I'll tell you, the next generation needs people to lead them towards Jesus. It, it may, be, may be in the public schools and you have influence on people. You can't lead overtly in a Jesus-y way, but you can lead subtly and you can lead in influence. It may be here in the church working with children or youth or, or women's ministries, but, but are you, do you have a place of influence? Listen for God to speak to you in those places. And we're going to look at these nine lessons. And, uh, and Jackie Scott, who's one of our uh, leadership team members, uh, is going to be reading the scripture tonight. And so I want to ask you, if you have your Bibles, be open to, to Colossians chapter 1. And, and she's going to read different passages. Sometimes she'll invite you to read with her, so pay attention. Sometimes she'll be reading and you'll listen. Sometimes she'll be reading and will invite you to read along. And so look in your Bibles at Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul, written from prison as he suffered for the sake of Jesus and the people of God. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Please be shocked by these words. Now I rejoice in my stuff and what I'm suffering. Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering. Why? Because I'm suffering for you. I want you to get a context here. The Apostle Paul is writing these words, inspired by the Holy Spirit, from jail. He's in prison. This is one of the four prison epistles or prison letters: Ephesians, Philippians, this book, Colossians, and Philemon. Those four books of the Bible were written by a leader in the church who followed Jesus, preached his word, and did everything he could to live for Jesus, and he got thrown in jail. Any idea that if I follow Jesus faithfully, it'll always go my way? You're not reading the Bible closely. Now, when I follow Jesus, is there always blessing? What's the answer? Yes. But does everything always go your way? What's the answer? No. Some of you are saying no like you understand what I'm talking about. Right? We don't, it doesn't always go our way, but God is always present. He's always blessing. So understand, he's writing from prison. He's incarcerated for living for Jesus. And here's lesson one. In these nine lessons, if you're a note taker, write them down or lock them in your hearts, lock them in your mind. Lesson one, for people who want to be strong followers of Jesus, joyfully suffer 
and willingly face afflictions, but here's the key, for the sake of the church, for the sake of the body of Christ. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are kind of like, I don't really like the church. I don't want to go to, I don't want to be around those people, those church people. And, and I hear people say that. I hear some pastors who say, I don't know if I really like my church. <laughs> Honestly. And, and yet, I, I think because the idea is, well, the church is supposed to love me and I'm supposed to love the church, and that's true, but being among God's people can stretch you, it can challenge you, it can sometimes have sharp edges to it because you're around people. But the Apostle Paul says with this, this sense of bold confidence, I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, the, the Christians at Colossae. You're God's church, and I'm suffering in prison for your sake. He says, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. It doesn't mean that Christ didn't fully suffer, but it means I'm entering into the journey of Christ's suffering. I'm suffering with Jesus, and because Jesus suffered for you, he calls me to follow him, and I'm suffering for you. Man, that's part of the call. And then he says, for the sake of his body. If you don't know what that means, he says, which is the church. Here's the invitation. Here's the challenge today. Will you make a decision to say, I will follow Jesus so closely and I will love the church, his people. The church is called the body of Christ, the bride of Jesus. Jesus loves his church. And when we don't love his church, we're making fun of his bride. When we put down the church, we're mocking his bride. Now, I'm not perfect, but I'll tell you what, don't mock my bride. I love my wife, I love my bride. And Jesus loves you, you're his church. So love the church and lay your life down for the sake of the church. Here's a question. How might we suffer for the sake of the church? What does that mean? I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's suffering. He suffered for the church, he laid his life down for the church, he's saying, I wanna do the same. Let me give you a few words. Serve. Serve in the local church. If you're visiting from another church, go home to your church and say, am I serving? Am I investing? Am I helping make the church a stronger place? And I think every, every person could, should say along the way, how can I serve and be a blessing within the church? Now, there's seasons of life. When, when our boys were, were like one, three, and five, my wife said, my primary ministry is serving the church at home. We got a little congregation, three little boys. And, I'm, and, and praise God. Later on, when they were like junior, senior high, Sherry actually stepped out of the workforce, working in the church, and said, I need to be home and available more. Because I feel called to serve that part of the church. I don't mean you have to serve in the church building, but serve God's people. And pour yourself out for them. Serve. Here's another word. Give. You want to learn to suffer? Learn to give. Because most people don't have the gift of giving. For most people, it stretches them. And I, I don't want to challenge you. When, when, when he says, I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you for the sake of his body, the church, I'm going to pour myself out. I think there are way too many Christians who take, 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 and give do very little giving. We had a, a group that came in and studied our church about three and a half years ago, so the Shoreline Church. As we were getting ready to give this challenge to be called to a new level of ministry, we had over $2 million of extra money came in, and we started an international ministry that's touching churches all over the world. We started a ministry in Guatemala. We did all these new things. We got things, our, our new children's area, our new youth area. It all came out of that because people gave, and they suffered and they sacrificed. But this group that came in and studied Shoreline Church they went through all of our membership, all of our numbers. They, they, we, you know, they were able to look at everything. And they came back and they said, do you know that over half the people that are part of Shoreline Church never give anything financially? I was blown away. My heart broke. And then he said, that's really rare. And basically said, that's one of the worst churches we've ever seen. <laughs> he said, churches just aren't, aren't people, you know, and as you go around the country, different places, and people give something but he says, there's so many people in your church that just never give anything. And I struggled with it. And, I, and I've never shared that with a congregation, but I feel like at a night of worship, I want to say to you, as people that are here wanting to worship Jesus, if you, if you want to follow this call to joyfully suffer and willingly face afflictions for the sake of the church, become a giver. You'll learn to suffer. Because when you learn to give, God actually calls you to do more. And for us to do what God's calling us to do in our community and the world, it takes all of God's people. If 100% of the people at Shoreline just every week or every month did something and just started learning to be generous, it would revolutionize our ministry because it would free us up to do things that we want to do but oftentimes we can't do. One more word in terms of suffering for the church. Forgive. Learn to forgive. 
Boy, Jesus talks about this over and over and over. The Bible talks about it over and over. And I know as a pastor, I'm doing a double naughty thing tonight. I've learned this in my years of ministry. The two things people don't want to hear about is giving and forgiving. And I'm talking about it both back to back. So you're going, bad pastor. But you know what? I'm just going to, I feel a preach coming on. I got, <laughs> I got to say what's on my heart. Okay? Jesus talks very seriously about forgiveness. If someone has wronged you in the body of Christ and you are holding bitterness over them and you, and you won't talk with them, you see them walking and you go, I'm going to look over there and walk over there. I don't even, it may be time for you to say, God, help me learn to forgive. See, forgiving someone doesn't say what they did was right. That's, what, that's our misconception. Well, if I forgive them, they think they're getting away with it. No, when you forgive someone, what are you saying? You did something wrong. Otherwise, I wouldn't need to forgive you. Forgiveness implies what you did was wrong, what you did was hurtful, what you did was sinful, but I choose in the power of Jesus to forgive. That, that's the call of Jesus. And let me tell you what, if you want to learn to suffer for the sake of the church, you learn to start forgiving people. It restores, it heals, the Holy Spirit shows up and does miracles when we start, start forgiving. But when I, when I preach about giving and when I talk about forgiving, that's when I get people come to me afterwards, giving me grief. Well, pastor, I don't know if I can come to church here anymore. That really bothered me. That really hurt me. Or people come and say, forgive. If you know what this person did for me, you'd know why they should never be forgiven. I mean, people tell me that on many occasions. I say, I don't, I don't know what they did, but God does. And he still calls you to forgive. That's a big topic. Forgiving doesn't mean you become a doormat and let them hurt you again. It doesn't mean that you have to keep letting them hurt you, but it means in your heart you have to say, God, you forgave me for everything. And I'm called through scripture to forgive other people as God in Christ forgave me. That's the model. So here's the invitation. Will you suffer for the church? Will you love the body of Christ, the church, enough to say, I will give, I will forgive, I will serve, I will pour myself out. I won't just be a consumer saying, what can I get? I will give something back consistently. Look with me in God's word at Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Let's read these words together, paying attention to the heartbeat of this declaration. It's gonna be on the screen, so read with me. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. There's a lot there in that one little verse, but here's lesson number two. Hear God's call to humbly serve the church. Now, I'm not just saying serve. I'm saying hear God's call. Listen, the Apostle Paul says, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me. He said, God commissioned me. God called me. Now, for, for, for Paul, who was Saul, it was quite a commission. He's killing Christians, destroying churches, knocked off his donkey, blinded. Jesus shows up, speaks to him, and says, you will preach for me, and you will suffer for me. And he goes, yes, Lord. <laughs> That's the short version. But it so impacted Paul that he told that story over and over again through the book of Acts. But he heard the call of God. He heard the commission of God. This will be your ministry. I want to tell you something, followers of Jesus. God has a commission for you. He has a ministry for you. I don't know what it is, but I know he has it. And if you will seek his face and make space in your life and ask him, what is your call? Lord Jesus, what is your commission? What is my ministry? What would you have me do? And you follow him into that, you will go on an adventure that will blow your mind. When I became a Christian, I was 15 years old. And God called me to teach. I, when I became a Christian, I had never had a Bible. I had never read the Bible. I would never held a Bible in my life. I didn't grow up going to Sunday school. I didn't grow up with any Bible stories at home. Nothing. And, and, I, and I knew God said, you will tell people about Jesus. That's what you're gonna do. So someone gave me a Bible and said, you're supposed to read it. You're a Christian, you're, this is your training, read the Bible. And I started digging in. And then the first time I was asked to stand up in front of a group and teach, I was just turned, I turned 16, it was Easter time, and the youth pastor came and said, hey, there's a sunrise service at the church, and will you come and share your testimony? And I said, I'd love to. What's a testimony? <laughs> I, didn't know, I did not know what a testimony, I said, what do you mean? He said, will you stand up in front of these people at this service? I didn't know it was gonna be the Arboretum at what became the Crystal Cathedral, it was Garden Grove Community Church. There was about 1,500 people there for the sunrise service. But he said, you're gonna stand up there and for about 10 minutes just tell the story about how you became a Christian and how your life has changed. Love to. I was 16. I started my ministry, my call to ministry, long before anyone paid me to be a pastor. 
I knew I wanted to be a pastor, but I knew I had to graduate from high school. I had 0.75 that year before I became a Christian. 0.75, you have to, how do you, I don't even know how you even give no 0.75, but I did, I did it. Um, and, and yet, I knew I had to finish high school and go to college and go to seminary, and all, but it's like, no, that's, that's my call. And for years, I would teach and preach the Bible anywhere anyone would let me for free if you would just let me open this book and teach the word of God. It became my passion. And the first time I got a paycheck for doing youth ministry, I felt kind of dirty. I was like, I would do this for free for the rest of my life. And then I realized I should probably have some money to pay bills and stuff. And so I said, okay, I'll take it. But, but I, I want to say, this is what I want to say to you. I want to pause and pray. The Apostle Paul says, I have become its servant, the servant of the church, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. This was God's call in my life. I would hope and pray. Tonight I, went, I walked through the hallway upstairs through Awana. And so, so I, do you know there's a bunch of adults that would love to be in here worshiping with us? But they're sacrificing and serving right now by pouring into your kids and your grandkids and teaching them the word of God. Praise God for that. So I walked down the hall and just checked in in a couple of the rooms. And, and I was so blessed by these people. That, and I would hope they would say this. This is my commission. This is the call of God. Our ushers, our greeters, our people in the parking lot, I hope they would say, this is my commission. This is the call of God. So I'm just filling the spot. I'm called by God to do this. Our people, our people who work in our care ministries and our lay counselors and, and work with grief share and our, our people that work with middle school kids and high school kids, our people that work with our, our women's ministry that serve all through this church. I hope they would not just say, oh, I do this thing where I help out. They would say, this is my call from God. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna give you 30 seconds to quiet your heart and to say to God, God, will you show me my calling? Will you commission me to serve you? and I will follow. I, he may do it right now, but I think it's gonna be more like in the coming days. But would, but, but would you just say, God, my heart is open. Begin to speak through people, circumstances, through the needs around me by your Holy Spirit. So right now, between you and Jesus, will you just, between, just do business with God for a moment and say, God, if you will commission me, if you will call me, if you will show me what you want me to do for your glory, I will follow. Talk to Jesus. God, in the coming hours and days and weeks, will you speak to us? Will you call and commission us to do the work you've called us to do, however big or small it might seem? It may be so small we think it's not a big deal. It may be so big we might say, I can't do it. But Lord, we are available. We will follow if you will speak. So we open our hearts. Would you show us some task of service that would honor you? And may we enter into it not just to fill a spot, but because we feel called and commissioned by the God of heaven. Now look in your eyes in your Bible or on the screen, again at Colossians chapter one, verse 25. Okay, we're gonna read this verse together again, and this time we're gonna notice what it says about God's word. Read with me. I have become servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The apostle Paul, the call was to present the word of God fully. And so here's lesson number three. It's exactly what the Bible says. Present the word of God in fullness. Teach and train and equip people to know this book. I wanna challenge you, and I feel, I feel like God wants us to, in a fresh new way with your children and your grandchildren, the next generation, your nieces and your nephews, the next generation. Would you begin to teach them the word of God. And you go, well, I, I, don't, you know, I don't know how to lead them in a Bible study. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, would you open this book every day and let God speak to you? And when you're around your grandkiddos, say, hey, honey, can I tell you, can I tell you what Jesus taught grandma this morning? Because I was spending time with Jesus and he showed up and he taught me something. Really, grandma? Yeah, Jesus taught me something. Well, what did he teach you? And you open the word and you talk about what God's been teaching you. I was out with three, with, with three of our pastors for lunch yesterday and it's a team that meets, we have lunch together once a month and we just, we do work of shoreline. But before, I said, before we get to our business, I said, this morning as I was reading God's word, I was, I was in 1 Kings chapter 11 and verses one through eight just blew my socks off. 
because I watched an entire kingdom of God's people crumble because of the stupid decisions of one person. And I sat at my desk and I, just, I almost wept. I'm just thinking, this, here's Solomon and he was so wise and doing so right. And then it says, but, but nevertheless, he did this. And the whole future of the nation changed. And we sat around the table. I said, I just want to share with you, God's causing me to look and say in my life, what's my nevertheless? Okay, Kevin's following Jesus, he's doing good. But nevertheless, he's doing this. For Solomon, he took on women, wives that didn't know God. And he set up temples for them to worship and his heart began to follow the false gods and the idols. The exact thing that God said, don't ever do that. So I sat there that, that yesterday morning going, okay, God, is there a nevertheless in my heart? Is there something that I'm following you, but nevertheless, there's this thing that if I'm not careful, it could take me down. And I said, I want us as leaders, as pastors at Shoreline, to ask, is there a nevertheless in our lives? And we just had a conversation about it. We talked about it together. I didn't plan a study I just met with Jesus in the morning. He spoke to me and I had to share it with somebody. Can you share with the next generation because you're steeped and immersed and marinating your soul in the word of God. Can you share what you're learning with your children, with your grandchildren, with your nieces, with your nephews? You might be in your 70s. So share with those young people in their 50s and talk to them about what you're learning. But let's, let's talk together. How often when you're with other Christians do you say, can I share with you what God's teaching me from his word? How often do you say that? When I became a Christian, the youth group I was part of, high school kids and young college kids, every time we would get together, we just, what are you learning from the word? Tell me. And so I wouldn't just have my own Bible study. I'd learn from Phil and I'd learn from Ty and I'd learn from Mark because they'd tell me what God was teaching them. And I'd tell them what God was teaching me. And we'd talk about the word of God. Let's get the word of God in our hearts so we can present the word of God in its fullness with the next generation, with our friends, with those around us. I want you to look in your Bibles at Colossians chapter 1, verse 26. Okay, this time I'm going to read the scripture, and I'm going to read it twice. And we want you to pay attention to the word mystery in the scripture and try to get a sense of what Paul is talking about. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you the hope of glory. Amen. I'll read it again. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I hope you got it. He's talking, there's, there's this mystery, this thing that's almost, almost hard to even understand. In the end of the verse 27, the glorious riches of this mystery, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the mystery of Christ. And this is what the Apostle Paul is saying. And listen close, he's saying, Jesus is for everybody. Because the Jewish people, the first Christians were almost all Jewish. They were waiting for the Messiah that was their Messiah, for their kingdom, for their people. They're waiting for our, so when Jesus came and those who recognized him as the Messiah, they said, okay, this is the Jewish Messiah. But there was this literally this dividing wall in the temple courtyard, this wall between the court of the Gentiles and the court of the Jews. In the Jewish mind, gent there was Jews and the rest of the world, everybody else. And they're called Gentiles. Two kinds of people in all the world. Us, Jews, everyone else, Gentiles. And here's the mystery. This Messiah, this Jewish Messiah is for everyone. This is the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I don't know about you. I'm a Gentile. I'm not, I didn't grow up Jewish. But Christ is in me and he is the hope of glory. Here's what I want you to hear. The people that you encounter, that you walk past each day, the people you encounter in the workplace, at your school, in your neighborhood, that you might look at and say, there's just no way they'd ever come to Jesus. Jesus is, is, is for certain people, but I don't know if, they, if Jesus is for them. Christ in them, the hope of glory is what God wants. That's what God desires. And I think the Apostle Paul is saying, understand this glorious mystery that Christ is for everyone who will put their faith in him. And, and so you watch the life of Jesus. And he got in trouble for hanging out with prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners, troublemakers. He got, that was his criticism because they're not clean. They're not religious enough. 
but he entered their lives, Christ in them, and he became their hope of glory. And that's what he did for you, and that's what he did for me. So will you live a life that shows that you understand that Christ is not just for those in the club and in the church. That's why as a church, we exist not just for ourselves, we exist and are consumed and we burn for the sake of the world. That's the call of the church. That's why we sent three pastors for three weeks to India and Sri Lanka to train pastors in evangelism. We, we had people who came to the training and they came and they were kind of coming saying, oh, it's just another training about, about evangelism and outreach, but... It's not gonna connect for us, but we're gonna go, and within hours of starting, they started calling other pastors, saying, you've gotta come. Because in India right now, it's illegal to proselytize, to share faith in certain ways, and the only way they know how to share the faith, the only way they learned was a way that's now illegal. So a lot of the pastors in India are saying, we can't share Jesus anymore. And when Pastor Walt, and when Pastor Tom, and when Pastor John from your church went over there and did five different two-day trainings, Pastor Walt threw a pneumonia, Kept teaching, Pastor Tom through sickness. They just kept teaching and going from town to town and doing their teaching. Over 600 pastors were equipped and trained and given resources to be able to equip people in the gospel. And you know what they said? They said, we can't share the gospel anymore that way, but this is even better. We can still do this. The laws that they've created, this goes under the radar because it's life on life, relational. It's organic. And so I want you to know that that as a church, we're sacrificing, we're giving, we're sending because we believe that Christ is the hope of glory, amen? Amen. And so we believe all people need to know Jesus. Look within your Bibles at Colossians chapter one, verse 28. Okay, we're gonna read this one together again. So look up at the screen or in your Bibles. He is the one we proclaim admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. And this is gonna be our capstone idea. I told you there's gonna be nine. I was kidding, there's gonna be five. Because I got preaching and I kept on going, but that's okay. We're, I'm gonna share this and then, and then the worship team get ready because I'm gonna have you come up a little bit earlier than you were thinking. But I want you to look at these words. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone, and listen to this, fully mature in Christ. Spiritual growth, spiritual maturity, that's the call of Jesus. That's why we're spending the next seven weeks at Shoreline on Sunday mornings, pouring into this idea, what does spiritual maturity look like? How do I know? I mean, how do I know? I go to my doctor and he can check my heartbeat, my cholesterol, all these different things, but spiritually, how do I know if I'm if from today and last week and next month and next year, if I've grown spiritually, it's a, it's a subjective thing. No, there's more to it than that. There's ways to know I'm growing spiritually. So we're gonna keep, we're gonna be presenting this to you and kind of teaching and saying, here's the different things that are really the markers, the measurements of spiritual growth. And then we're gonna say, here's how you can grow. Here's how you can grow personally, corporately in the life of the church. And we're gonna give you pathways and resources. So you might, and we're actually creating a tool. It's like a survey tool that you can do on your own And look at it and you can say, okay, of the seven things that show spiritual maturity, I'm really strong in these three, and these two, I'm really weak. I'm just not strong in those areas. And there are things that the Bible says, this is what a mature Christian looks like. And you're gonna say, well, how do I get stronger in that? We're gonna give you all kinds of tools and ways to grow in that. And so I hope you take advantage of that. I hope you pray for our whole congregation that we see our congregation just grow in spiritual maturity because that's God's desire. So here's a word for the church. Uh, We we can't, as a church, do what God's called us to do without our congregation rising up and each person doing their part. And the fact that you're here tonight, this is our once a month communion time and and kind of believer service where we're saying we believe that those who come here on Sunday mornings, we we had had about, I think, 18 people make a commitment to Jesus this last Sunday in our different services. We had 10 of them come forward and get Bibles for the first time. We know there's non-believers every time we gather. But when we gather in this time, we're really saying this is a time for believers to get together and go deeper. So I wanna challenge you as the folks that would say, I'm coming midweek and being part of this. Will you say for the next seven weeks, will you do two things? One, do everything you can to be here with your heart open to learn and say, God, take me deeper. And it was amazing to me this last Sunday how many people raised their hand who are believers and said, I wanna go deeper, I wanna know Jesus more, I wanna take the next step. Will you be here? And if you, and if you miss a week, will you go online and watch the message and get caught up and, and walk with us for seven weeks? And when we, when we roll the survey out in about four or five weeks from now, will you do that survey? And keep the information for yourself. And if you'll share it with us as a church, I'd love to have a few hundred people tell us as a congregation where we're strongest and where we need to grow so I can know how to preach. If we got like almost everybody struggling in one area, let's go deeper there. 
right? And so we want to learn, we want to learn together. We want to grow together because we, we, we are a body. We grow in community. And so I, I want to ask you, number one, will you be here for the next seven weeks? And do all you can on Sunday mornings to be present and be engaged. Number two, will you pray with me for our congregation? Will you pray that God will take us deeper than we've gone before? Will you pray for people who are on the fringes and kind of, I love Jesus, I believe in Jesus, but I don't really want to engage, that God will draw them in because they need the body of Christ. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we thank you for your word, uh, your word that is powerful, your word that is, is glorious and life-changing. We thank you for the privilege of worship, and we thank you right now uh, for the gift of communion, that as your people we can gather and we can break the bread and partake of the cup and come into your presence in community together. So Lord, prepare us not just to eat bread and drink of the cup. Prepare us to meet you, Jesus, to encounter you and be encountered by you. We pray this for the glory of Jesus who is here with us. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you as we partake of communion this evening to prepare your heart. And let's begin by just listening to God's word and what it says about this great gift of communion. Yeah, in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 20 through 26, we read this. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Our servers are gonna be passing the bread and the cup. When it comes to you, will you hold on to it? Hold the bread in one hand, hold the cup in another hand, and, and think about the body of Christ. Think about the blood of Christ because we're gonna partake together as a, as, a, as a congregation. So as the elements are being passed, we wanna think about what this means, what it is we're doing. And Jesus said at the Last Supper, do this in remembrance of me. So as you hold the bread, as you hold the cup, as you prepare to partake as we do all together as a congregation, let's remember that Jesus left heaven and came to this earth. He humbly left the glory of heaven. He somehow set aside whatever, and I don't even know as a pastor how to explain it. He, how does God come as a man? I don't fully know that, but he somehow set something aside. He remained divine, and yet he came and took on human flesh and humbly came. Remember the coming of Jesus. And as we partake in communion, let's also remember the love and sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus lived a life marked by love. He loved his friends. He loved the marginalized and the forgotten in society. And he even loved his enemies. I think of Jesus loving through as his closest followers uh, denied him, as they doubted him, and even as one at the table betrayed him. We also remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, Jesus sacrificed a glorious heavenly throne to come down and live among us. He sacrificed his own will as he came to that day when he would be crucified. And he said, not my will, God, but yours be done. And he took the cup, he took the cross. And we know that he ultimately sacrificed everything when he gave his life for our sins. So as we come to communion, let's remember that perfect love and the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. So at the table, we remember that he humbly left heaven and came among us. We remember that he lived a life of sacrifice and surrender. But we also remember this, that on the cross, he died. Many of you already have the bread in one hand or the cup and you're holding those things. That on the cross, his body was broken. His blood was poured out. And he died. He bore our sins, he took our shame, he took our stripes, he offered healing, and he died. And he was in the tomb for three days. And that communion, we also remember that he rose again in glory, and he's alive today. As we come to the table, we remember this Jesus. And so I wanna invite you, as you have the elements, just to hold them in your hands, to be prayerful, to reflect on what this means. I wanna give an invitation uh, that uh, if you are uh, here from another Christian congregation uh, and you're kind of holding the element saying, well, in my church, we don't 
You know, you have to be part of our church. And Shoreline, our, our belief is that this is the table of Jesus. And so he invites you to come. Not Shoreline Church, Jesus. It's his table. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe in him, then, then partake with us. Be part of this experience. So I'd like to invite you to uh, take the bread and just look at the bread for a moment in your hand. Because Jesus at the table took the bread and he broke it before his disciples. And he said, this is my body broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. Let's together as a sign of our unity in Jesus Christ partake of the bread and as you partake of the bread, remember his broken body. Let's partake together. Now as you hold the cup, we remember Jesus' blood poured out for our sins. Let's take the cup together as a family and remember this ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we don't do this lightly. We uh, pause and remember uh, the perfect sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And Jesus, we sit here today and we do what you've commanded us to do as we remember and we just wanna say thank you. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you for giving of yourself. And thank you for the new life we found in you. So help us to live in that new life, in that abundance every day. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray.